Good morning, Resurrection Church. Thanks for joining us here on Facebook Live or on YouTube. I hope you are doing well. Again, we have a couple more weeks of household worship, uh, and then we'll be transitioning into the next phase of our COVID-19 ministry strategy, which is sort of a robust live stream simultaneously happening with the in-person worship gathering. So for those of you who feel comfortable, we'll have as safe of an environment as we can possibly have on June the 7th here in the theater for you to come and be a part of our liturgy in person. Or if you're more comfortable or need to be staying at home in this season, you are certainly uh, loved and, and we're glad that you're making that decision. And uh, we'll have a live stream component for you. Um, and it'll run at the same time. It'll be what's going on in the theater. So as to um, facilitate and foster community in as much as we can in this intermediary season. And that's really all I've got. Please stay tuned on our social media page. Look for emails if updates come. When we get close to the date, we'll be putting out all the graphics, as I've said, with um, the exact modifications. For now, again, families will all be together. Services will be a little shorter. Um, will be spaced out, all kinds of different things. So uh, be on the lookout for that once we get to about a week or so out from the next stage of COVID-19 ministry. So with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and draw near for worship. Call to worship. Let us worship our God together. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you are good and we love you and we are thankful for the opportunity this morning uh, to gather digitally and virtually um, to lift praise to you, to encourage each other, to build one another up and spur one another on to love and good deeds. I pray that the gospel will be made clear this morning. I pray that uh, everyone tuning in will be blessed. I pray that um, many will tune in this morning and believe the gospel of Jesus, uh, if perhaps even for the first time. So have your way in our homes this morning. Have your way among us. Cultivate in us a healthy longing to gather again in person and an even stronger longing for all to be made well when your kingdom comes in fullness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. <laughs> 
a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning and the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 Amen. So each week in our liturgy, we confess our sins together as one people with one voice. So in our homes together, let's pray this prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Each week we confess our sins and are reminded of God's grace and goodness towards us in Christ. I remind you of God's love for you in Christ Jesus. He has died in your place. He has risen from the dead, and he is yours forevermore. This morning we are forgiven and loved. Let's continue to worship in that reality. And come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of Never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise, and teach me some melodious sonnets sung by flame. 
Amen. Thank you, Nate and Lizzie and Matt, for leading us in song. Now we shift our focus to the scriptures, specifically 1 Peter, where we are spending some time in this letter. Uh, Peter is speaking to how we live the Christian life well in exile, wherever we may find ourselves. Last week, we considered the Christian's relationship with human institutions broadly and the government more specifically. This week and next, Peter gets a bit closer to home, if you will. This week, we'll think about the relationship between a servant and a master. And next week, we'll think about the relationship between a husband and a wife. Now, I want to speak to this idea of a servant and master relationship in its first century context. I want to make sure we understand what Peter is saying and what he's not saying and understand a a little bit of basic context around sort of um, the institution of servitude, forced servitude, or, or slavery, if you will. But I want to also draw implications from this teaching for sort of the employee employer relationship that we would have in our day, knowing that these relationships are not an apples to apples comparison. Then I want us to see Jesus as our example in suffering and our substitute in suffering. After sort of commending suffering to servants, Peter shifts their eyes to Jesus, their example in suffering and their substitute in suffering. I want to make the case that Jesus being our example in suffering is not in and of itself good news if he were not our substitute in suffering. We are free to look to Jesus in our suffering as an example because Jesus is our substitute in suffering. We look to Jesus in our suffering because Jesus has suffered for us. That's the big idea, I hope you get. We look to Jesus in our suffering because Jesus has suffered for us, whether that suffering is uh, more extreme on a scale of 1 to 10, a 10, or, or closer to a 1. 
So let's jump right into the text. First Peter chapter two, we're in verses 18 through 20 for the first part of the text and then 21 through 25 for the second or parts of the sermon rather. Verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Uh, This is admittedly a difficult text that I can't say I'm too pleased to be preaching on Facebook. Uh, Essentially, the command in view here is for servants to subject themselves to both um, good and unjust masters, using the same line of logic, the same commands that we saw uh, last week in the ways that we think about our relationship with the government. Peter uh, commends a mindfulness of God in suffering and awareness that the suffering is happening in the sight of God, um, sort of a promise that unjust suffering is a gracious thing in God's sight, that uh, it doesn't escape his perspective or view. Uh, It's worth taking a few moments to consider the sort of servitude or slavery in view here. This first century slavery, we'll use the word slavery, is different than the sort of slavery that's in our cultural psyche in the fact that it's not necessarily chattel race-based slavery where one group of people systematically oppresses another group of people on the basis of race. One became a slave for many reasons or in many ways in the first century, perhaps um, They were captured in war, perhaps they were kidnapped, or perhaps they were born into a family of slaves, perhaps they fell into debt, perhaps they voluntarily sold themselves into slavery uh, to pay off debt, or because they faced extreme economic hardship. Uh, There were a lot of slaves. The percentage of slaves in the Roman Empire varies from historian to historian, but there were quite a few. A slave in this time could perhaps purchase their freedom through a process called manumission, but a lot of scholars argue that this is nothing more than a pipe dream for the vast majority of Roman slaves. So hear this very, very clearly. Um, Slavery and forced servitude is not a good social institution, and slavery in the first century um, is not a pleasant experience. So our cultural sensibilities, I think in a good sense, force us to ask some questions of the text. Why doesn't Peter sort of give a a blanket condemnation of the practice of of forced servitude? I can't say exactly, um, but there are three things I want us to keep in mind as we approach uh, a text like this or where Paul may speak of um, slavery or, or forced servitude. Think about the audience. Think about who Peter's writing to. Peter isn't speaking to people who have the privilege of making or impacting policy. Peter is speaking to some of the lowest people on the social ladder of their day. Many of his hearers, perhaps most depending on who you ask, would have been slaves and servants wondering how to live a godly life when they're stuck with a master who is unfair, who is cruel, and who is not a godly man. So Peter writes for people who are not living in a place of privilege where they can change policies and make them more God-honoring. He's speaking to people who are stuck and he's giving them hope that God is with them even in their suffering. Now, just a a brief preaching point, if you will um, humor me for a moment and please hear what I'm saying. The early church was extremely, um, well, sorry, the gospel in the early church went forward largely amongst the poorest classes of people. Uh, That generally is not the case today. And the question is, why? I really believe that there comes times when we must, must preach to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. 
I believe the gospel is good news for the poor and the despised and the broken among us. And we must ask if we are not reaching people on the lower rungs of society's ladder, then are we preaching the same gospel that Jesus preached? Or are we preaching the gospel in the same way that Jesus preached it? Peter, our first point, is speaking to a lot of slaves and servants who are asking how they live in such hopelessness. And he reminds them that God is with them. Second, uh, this point is related to the first. The church in the first century is not large enough or powerful enough to tackle social ills at the level of the whole empire. It's just not on their radar. It's not something they think is possible. And in many ways, at that moment in time and space, it was not possible. Peter is preaching the best way you can be winsome is to live like Jesus, even in broken social systems. Now, I would add here that when gospel principles and biblical ethics are rightly and broadly understood, societies should and societies must move to change broken social systems. So, ideally, this doesn't always happen as well as it should. When Christians are in charge, Christians should lead like Christ, and institutions like slavery should be abolished. Of course, many Christians were um, silent during uh, the days of slave trade in the British Empire, but praise God for Christians like William Wilberforce, who worked to eventually end the slave trade. Third, um, Peter does not here or anywhere in the Bible commend slavery as an institution or as a system for society. Um, The scriptures do not advocate for slavery and they do not provide theological grounds for its existence. In many ways, they provide the theological grounds for its existence eradication. So with all that in view that I think we needed to take some time to explain, the command is to be subject to your masters with all respect, both the good and gentle and the unjust. There are two phrases here in this text that I think are very important. Mindful of God and in the sight of God. Mindful of God and in the sight of God. Um, Peter speaks to these servants Be mindful of God in your suffering and know that you are enduring suffering in the sight of God. Meaning, he sees, he knows what you're going through, and he will reward you. It's gracious in the sight of God when one of his people suffers unjustly. That God um, is aware of what's going on. He sees what's going on. He will repay the one who is oppressing you. And he will reward you for your obedience, not simply to your master, but to him. So I want to take this counsel with all caveats given that an employee today in a relationship with his or her employer is very, very different than a servant and a master, but sort of as common denominator, sort of these economic systems where one is working for or submitting to in some capacity another. And I want to think a little bit here about those of you who are working in jobs that you do not like, who are working in jobs that are not fulfilling and working for people that may or may not be understanding. Those two phrases are so helpful. Be mindful of God. Be mindful of God. And know that suffering, enduring through suffering, is gracious in the sight of God. So what I, what I want to argue here is that wherever you find yourself on 9 to 5, right, Monday through Friday, or whatever your job may be, set your mind on God And realize as you're sitting at your desk, as you're in your office, as you're wherever you are, um, that God sees, that God knows, that God cares, that God's with you, that all of life happens before the face of God. I know it sounds great, but really try to set your mind on God when you go into work and realize every day as you're sitting at your desk that you are in the sight of your heavenly Father and that you are going to choose to live in ways that please Him even in the smallest and most menial tasks. 
Work as if you're working directly for him. Love the people around you even if they're hard to love. Go the extra mile. When others are complaining, you choose not to. Demonstrate the gracious love of Christ in your workplace. For many of you, your workplace is a draining place. But when you're working and mindful of God, aware that all of this is happening before His face, as your workplace drains you, the Spirit of God can fill you. The best spiritual seasons of our lives, I think this is important, they don't always happen when our lives are exactly where we think they should be. In my experience, some of the most spiritually fulfilling days of my life, some of the days of my life in which I was growing the most spiritually weren't days when I was in full-time ministry. God's not waiting for you out there. He won't make your life whole once you get away from that job or once you get away from that boss or once you find something to do that you think is more beneficial for the kingdom of God. He won't make your life easier when you get rid of toxic or difficult people automatically. In the path of unjust suffering, there is much grace. And that is the path that Jesus tread. So if you walk through a life that is not easy, know that that path has been tread by another. That Jesus has suffered for us as an example in our suffering, whether it's slave on one end or it's not a great boss on the other end. He suffered for us as an example and as a substitute. Look with me in verses 21 through 25. For this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you are straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." If you underline or highlight in your Bibles, um, I highlighted leaving you an example and bore our sins in his body. We think about Jesus as our example and as our substitute. Let's think of Jesus as our example. Christ suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sins, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten the one inflicting the pain, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He remained mindful of the Father, trusting that he would bring full justice. Jesus shows us in his life and death how to live when others persecute us. He shows us the way of God's humble servant. But I want to make the case that if he is just an example, then we're in pretty big trouble. Um, golfing with my friend Ritwick in our church this weekend. And Ritwick was like all conference at UC. I mean, he's a very good golfer. And so when you see him go up to the tee box, right? And I'm not even going to fake the swing. And he does his golf swing. It's beautiful. It's like, it's a perfect example of how we should swing a golf club. Um, I will then get up on the tee box after he has gotten up on the tee box. And I will approach the ball. And I might hit it. And I might hit it straight. I might top it. I might pop it straight up. I might hit it to the right. I might hit it to the left. I'm probably going to slice it. See, just because I have the example of how to swing the club and how to strike the ball, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be able just automatically to have the ability to follow that example. If anything, the example makes me feel worse about myself. I can't do that. I, 
An example is helpful, but an example without ability is not helpful. In many ways, that leads to despair. And so when you hold up sort of the morality of Christ, when you hold up the way of the suffering servant, we see Jesus who is reviled but chooses not to revile in return but to love. We see Jesus who suffers but doesn't call a legion of angels down to deal with the guy that's bothering him. Like, that's what I would do. When I am reviled or when someone doesn't like me, then I tend to be skeptical of them. I, it's not easy for me to love them or like them. I, and if someone is treating me poorly, then I want to just attack them. I want to go after them. I want, to, I want to inflict pain on them if they've inflicted pain on me. The moral example of Jesus is wonderful, but does that necessarily mean I'm able or you are able or we are able to follow that example? Not really. Just because he shows me what to do does not mean I have the ability to do it. Yes, an example is good, but an example without ability leads to hopelessness and despair. So enter verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter says, we have more than an example. We have a substitute in our place. He bore our sins on his body, on that tree, on the cross. And he bore our sins on his body, on that tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Peter quotes from Isaiah, by his wounds you have been healed. The punishment that brought us peace right, was placed upon him. You were straying like a sheep. You were lost. You were scattered. You were walking to your death. But your shepherd has come, and the good shepherd, as Jesus says, lays down his life for his sheep. And he's returned us to his pasture, where we eat, drink, and be merry in the sight of God, our shepherd and overseer. When Jesus died on the cross, something profoundly spiritual and intimately personal is happening. He bore our sins in his body. What does it mean that he bore our sins? It means he took them as his own. He took the sins that we committed, that I committed, that you committed, and he bore those sins on his body. Elsewhere, the scriptures say, he became sin who knew no sin, that we may become the righteousness of God. This is not just good advice. This isn't Peter saying, hey, man, suffering really is awful. I know it's the worst. And I know your master is terrible. Uh, but just like be nice, be good, and l remember Jesus. He doesn't just give good advice. He gives good news. This is not pure moralism. This is gospel. This is the blazing center of Christian truth, that Jesus is not just your example in suffering, but that Jesus has suffered for you so that you could die to sin and that you could live to righteousness. Now, normally when we present the gospel here uh, in the U.S., we, we focus on uh, Jesus will forgive you of all your sins, which is certainly true, and we must focus on that. We, we, we remind people or we teach people that he did this so that you can have eternal life, so that you can live in heaven with him. And you can be sort of on God's side as everything um, plays out. And that is true out there that when we are saved, we will end up with God for all of eternity. But in this text, Peter has something much more immediate in mind. He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and what? Live the righteousness, that there's a right here, right now component sort of to the gospel that he died. He bore our sins when he died so that today we might not be enslaved to sin, but that we might live righteous lives. He took our sin and killed it on the cross so that we no longer have to live for it. He has given us life that we may live 
righteously. Jesus died my death and your death, and he empowers us through his spirit to live his life and follow his example. Yeah, his suffering is an example, but it accomplished so much more. His wounds have healed us. He has returned us to the overseer of our souls. He has borne our sins on his body so that we may be made whole. Jesus is the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep and has brought us to himself. We are in his pasture. We are his people. He is our good shepherd. He is our overseer. It's better to be a servant in the house of an unjust master than to be the king of an empire. This is the gospel at the blazing center of the Christian life that Jesus Christ has suffered in our place and the life we live, we live now for him. I love that here Peter inserts this beautiful gospel truth in these commands to Christian servants. Servant, your debt has been paid in full by Jesus. And every sin against you from your evil and unjust master has a date with destiny. They will either be settled at the cross or they will be settled on judgment day. That God is making all things sad, untrue through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. So Christian, you are forgiven in Christ. You are free in Christ, as we talked about last week. You are made whole in Christ. You are well by his wounds. You have been healed and you're in good hands. Even if right now you're not in good hands, ultimately you're in the hands of the good shepherd. You're in the hands of the almighty overseer. Because Christian Jesus, the suffering servant, has died in your place. He has suffered for you so that you may live for him. Now see his example. Go into the world and follow it. Live like him. Be like him. Be the fragrance of the gospel for all those around you, knowing that God sees, God knows, God cares, God loves you, and in his time, God will bring justice to even the most evildoer. Amen. For our prayer this morning, I want to focus on two groups of people. The first um, are those who may have tuned in and for the first time really heard um, a somewhat clear gospel presentation of Jesus dying in our place, bearing our sins. And I want you to know that God knows you, God loves you. And in Jesus, there's a way that you can know him and be made right with him. And you can die to your sin and live to righteousness now and forever. And if that's you, I encourage you just to drop us a message. I would say comment, which you're more than welcome to comment and we can all celebrate together. But um, you're probably more comfortable messaging the church, messaging me. We'd love to get you connected um, and help you grow in your faith. Uh, and explain more about the gospel and, and what it means to be a Christian. The second group of people uh, are the, that I'm thinking about are those who are in jobs that really are tough. They really don't like, and they feel like they're spinning their wheels. I want you this morning, if that's you, to be refreshed and encouraged, knowing that, yeah, your job may drain you, but the Holy Spirit of God fills you and God calls you to live well in that space and not to waste it. So those are the two people that I'm really thinking about and, and praying about. And so let's just pray briefly. Father, I pray that many will tune in to um, this sermon. Or they'll go back and, and watch it and, and hear um, of a substitute, Lord. Hear of a Jesus who has died in their place. Um, that they may die to sin and live to righteousness. I pray that um, you would grant them repentance and faith as they, as they hear your word. Um, we lift up together uh, our brothers and sisters who um, in many ways are in difficult situations and are um, 
some degree of difficulty in their daily life. I pray that they will endure that with grace and love and humility um, in the pattern of Jesus, our suffering servant. So, Father, fill them. Uh, keep them mindful of you. Keep them aware um, that they are beloved in your sight. Um, remind them of your power and your justice and your goodness. Um, Encourage them this morning, Lord, uh, to, to keep fighting the fight of faith, to keep fighting um, sin and keep pressing in to follow you, trusting that joy is theirs today in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I encourage you to go ahead and give right now. Uh, this is sort of the more informal part of our video stream um, things are opening back up uh, slowly but surely. Uh, people are getting back on their feet, but in many ways, um, economic hardships are, are only beginning for many people. So my prayer for us as a church, and I'm going to push us to be generous, both in our giving to the church and our giving uh, from the church um, to others. So uh, may we be a generous people who give, understanding that our resources are, are truly God's resources. Um, then now I encourage you to pass the peace, um, to think about some folks you haven't talked to from the church, um, shoot them a text, add them on Facebook, um, DM them as appropriate on Twitter, Instagram, wherever, however you can contact them. Um, please over these next couple of weeks, as we round out this season, um, and move into the next, let's do it together. Um, let's not leave anyone on an Island, um, please. So we've prayed, um, I've encouraged you to give, I've encouraged you to pass the peace, to, to follow up with people in the church, and now we will close our time of uh, distant yet unified worship with the singing of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all 